And we are, as a people, inherently and historically Wake up. opposed to secret societies, the Se secret oath, and the secret proceedings. The show that asks questions about why we don't ask questions. What the hell is going on? This is Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. Welcome to Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. I am Alan Park. These are Conspiracy Queries. My guest this week is Joel Chipkar, and he is a very knowledgeable practitioner of Falun Dafa, Falun Gong, as well. It's the same thing. This is a meditation practice, of which there are many in the world, but this particular meditation practice is regarded by many to have absolutely wonderful results as long as you don't count getting killed by the government as a wonderful result. But it is a result nonetheless. Yes, that's what happens to a lot of practitioners of this uh, technique in China. That's right. In China, you're not allowed to practice this kind of meditation. Perhaps there are other kinds of meditation you are also not allowed to practice. I don't know. I'll have to ask Joel when he comes on. But before that happens, there's a lot going on this week, including the thin end of the wedge when it comes to Internet censorship. David Cameron over there in England, the prime minister fella, the current uh, number one England puppet right now. Under his watch, we have got a watch going for the Internet. And this is a classic elitist move to presumably be solving one problem while creating a much more serious problem. This is from Wired. Dot co dot UK. The British Prime Minister has internet filters that will be about more than just hardcore pornography. That's what they're ushering it in under to get rid of the, all that terrible porn that is your right to choose to watch or not watch. And the government's going to help you with that. Now, according to information obtained by the Open Rights Group, the organization which campaigns for digital freedoms has spoken to some of the internet service providers constructing Cameron's content filters. They've discovered that a host of other categories of supposedly objectionable material may also be on the block. As well as pornography, users may automatically be opted in on a violent material, extremist-related content, anorexia and eating disorder websites, suicide-related websites, alcohol and smoking-related websites. But here's what really blows my mind and cannot stand. The list includes blocking web forums and esoteric material, whatever that is. That is ridiculous. What is esoterica? What is esoteric? Well, that's whatever the government decides is something they don't want you to spend your time on. So I will uh, speak up now and give forewarning to hacktivists, be they anonymous or WikiLeaks or whoever, uh, or some new formation of Internet denizens that will not take no for an answer. I urge you, do not let this happen. Turn these clowns upside down. When you're going to make something that is esoteric illegal, you are just leaving the window open wide enough to shut out anything that you want. So that's got to stop. We can't have that at all. Uh, as well, let's move on to the continued poisoning of our homeland, land of the natives. And that's what's happening all over the place from the food we eat, if you can call it food. And if it's in a box, uh, damn near 100% that the food that you're eating coming from a box that has a paragraph of tiny print, multisyllabic jargon uh, under the word ingredients, it's not really food. It's a product. But that's not the kind of pollution I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Alberta tar sands that continues to get insufficient press coverage, the leakages that have been going on for weeks. And pretty soon I hope to be speaking to some experts about that, hopefully next week or the week after. You do have to dig deep to get a lot of the real news when it comes to some quote-unquote energy production. So this week we're going to keep the energy-based complaints to a minimum. And uh, for now, here is an item from miningweekly.com. The father of fracking, George P. Mitchell, has died at the age of 94. Uh, George invented fracking, is the short form for the term hydraulic fracturing. 
George Phidias Mitchell has left us at the age of 94. The Texan energy billionaire was a petroleum engineer who transformed the natural gas industry by using hydraulic fracturing to extract the fuel out of shale formations. Larry Nichols, a friend of his and energy business cohort, says Mitchell was a true visionary and pioneer. And he leaves a legacy that is spreading worldwide. One that for decades to come will be known as the Shale Revolution. Yes, Mitchell is gone. His casket will be lowered into a much deeper than usual burial plot wherein water and sand and toxic fluids will be blasted at a high pressure without giving any concern as to how this final send-off will affect the other graves in the cemetery or the drinking water of the local citizens. From there, we turn to our guest today, Joel Chipcar. He is a long-term practitioner of the meditative practice known as Falun Dafa or Falun Gong. And he, uh, he's been doing this for 14 years. And we're going to find out exactly what it is, what it means, and what has happened to those practitioners that reside in China. Hello, Joel Chipcar. How are you today? Great, Alan. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Um, can you uh, explain to myself and uh, people in the audience listening, what is Falun Gong meditation? And uh, as I recall, it used to be called Falun Gong, and now it's called Falun Dafa. Maybe talk a little bit about the name change right? and what it is. Yeah, there is no name change. It's synonymous. Falun Gong, Falun Dafa is, a, is the same thing. Falun Dafa means law wheel of the great law, Falun Gong, the gong is the energy, the exercise, the energy of the, uh, uh, of the practice itself. It's basically uh, a spiritual discipline that helps its practitioners to enlighten, you know, to their spiritual truth. It's, the premise of it is a practitioner will assimilate his mind and his body through gentle exercises and also through uh, theory to assimilate his body to what we believe the universal characteristics are, uh, which is Jen Shen Ren, or truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance. Like, we believe every molecule in the universe has this as its essence, uh, this characteristic as its essence. So once a practitioner assimilates his mind and his body to these characteristics, it's a lot easier to enlighten to your spiritual truth. Okay. You might have left me a little bit in the dirt with some of that explanation, but then again, I'm not a practitioner. <laughs> what is... Uh, uh, let, this... me put it, let me put it this way, Alan. You know, every, every spiritual discipline, every religion has a goal, right? Yes. A goal of, let's say, Christianity is, to, is for human beings to reach heaven, right? Goal of uh, Buddhists is to reach consummation. Uh, Falun Gong has a goal as well, and its goal is to help people who practice Falun Gong reach enlightenment. It's another, it's, it's another word for reaching consummation or ascending to heaven. It's, it's, it's a human being's perfection is to reach their enlightenment, okay? And in order, order to do that, you have to purify your body and mind. You know, you've got to get rid of things like greed, anger, jealousy, um, all of these defilements that keep the human being locked in what we believe is like a maze of suffering, right? Don't tell me what I have to do. <laughs> I'm angry about you telling me. This is my show. <laughs> exactly, so right? So you have well, to lose all, all that. Those, you know, those kind of uh, uh, short fuses, right? So Falun Gong helps, helped me. I've been practicing this now for almost 14 years. You know, as, as, a, as a personal experience, it helped me better relate to my family members. It helped me to become more of a peaceful person. I always had a mind that was racing from thought to thought to thought. And I remember when I was younger, I said to myself once looking up at the sky, I said, why can't I find my peace of mind? Yeah. And Falun Gong helped me to attain that peace of mind. Now, had you explored other spiritual practices and disciplines such as yoga or any other kind of... Uh... Uh, Christianity, you mentioned some other religions. You know what, I'm a a bit of an oddball in that respect. I mean, I grew up in Christianity. My mother forced us to go to church, and for me it was like in one ear and out the other. When I got old enough, I looked at spirituality and religion as, you know, it was just a money-making machine. Everybody had the answer as long as you had the money to pay them. 
Right. So, so that, I never that's what really I wanted to. A spiritual person. And I that, wanted to bring you know, that up as well with you. Is it uh, how much does it cost to learn uh, how to do Falun Gong? Well, that's Falun another Dafa. thing. You know, when I when I got into my thirties, I realized that I needed something to kind of balance the uh, my hectic life, and I started to look into meditations, and I started to look into other things, and I realized that you know what, every everybody wants money, and I always had this premise in my soul. I kind of felt that. The true spirituality, like the true way, would be free. Everyone could practice it, and nobody would come to your door looking for money. And Falun Gong was just like that. Uh, you know, I've been practicing again for 14 years, and nobody has ever asked me for a dime. Nobody has ever asked me what my name was. Um, you know, I, I just felt that I was free to come, free to go. I would go to practice sites, uh, and they would teach me the exercises absolutely free. And I and I, I would be actually astonished. I would be waiting for like the, the plate to come around, and it never came around, right? So that that really, uh, you know, created some bonus points uh, in my eyes for Falun Gong. So it's not a money grab, obviously. Right. Where did the funds come from to print uh, leaflets and maintain a website that's very extensive, by the way? Volunteers. You know what? Um, uh, we'll kind of split the two because I know that you, we're going to get start talking about the persecution in in, in a couple minutes. But the, the practice of Falun Gong itself is it's on the website for free. You can download all the information. You can learn the exercises. You can come to practice sites all over you know Canada or the United States or Asia or Europe, absolutely free of charge, and people will uh, teach you. Um, any of the pamphlets that you see or the, the, the flyers or the website, all voluntarily, all voluntarily done. I myself in the past have helped to print flyers because I just wanted to give them out to my friends and family and, and people in my community to give them an opportunity to, to see what this was, right? So, um, again, it's, it's actually against the principles of Falun Gong to charge money and to take money or donations from people. Right. Okay. Now tell me a little bit about... Uh... You, you know, you're spiritually cleansing and you're also physically cleansing. So is there something in or about Falun Gong that leads you to uh, change what you put inside your body on a regular basis? No. Uh, you're free to do anything you want, uh, basically, with it, of course, within the principles. The only thing that Falun Gong, um, you know, asks practitioners to consider is don't drink alcohol, don't smoke cigarettes. No booze. No booze, no smokes. <laughs> no smokes. So, I mean, well, you know, there, there's premises behind those. I mean, everyone knows that smoking not bad, uh, is bad for you, so of course that's a, that's a given, right? The alcohol, uh, I mean, it's been used in, you know, times to bring down societies, right? I mean, it's, it, it's obvious it's an addiction. Um, it makes the mind confused a little bit at times. Uh, Falun Gong helps to purify and strengthen the main consciousness. So there's no states of trance, there's no visualization, there's no mantras, there's no worship to a certain god. It's basically just solid, um, main, you know, clear consciousness. So we know we're the ones doing the exercises, and in the end, we will be the ones who benefit from that. So this is not a, a, an exclusive thing. Like you could be a Christian practitioner, a Jewish practitioner, a Muslim practitioner. It, it, that is a. It doesn't interfere. It doesn't interfere in the beginning, but there are principles in every in every religion and spiritual practice as well that basically states, you know what, you shouldn't put your foot in two boats. If you want to learn Christianity, try Christianity, see how far you get. If you feel you've enlightened in it and, and you're ready to move on, then you can try something else. But if you do two things at the same time, they may interfere with each other. So on some levels, do you get, uh, or do you know others that experience uh, resistance or, or, let's say, a modified attack from a, a, a Christian or, 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 you know, other uh, spiritual uh, religious institutions? Do they say, well, you shouldn't be doing... I could just see Pat Robertson sitting down, you know, answering letters on that dopey segment that he has, uh, chastising this as as a way of Satan, if it if it's leading you away from Christianity. Yeah, well, you know what? Every every religion has their ways to protect their flock, right? They don't want their members going other places for for you know obvious reasons. Um, but Falun Gong doesn't uh, actually. To tell you the truth, I I learned more about Christianity and, and the respect for Christianity learning Falun Gong than I did when I was a, an, an actual Christian in my youth. <laughs> wow! So it's very open. Um, doesn't badmouth anybody. Doesn't you know attack anyone. 
uh, again, the principles are truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance. So, you know, you, you can draw the line. Right. And I did mention uh, Satan earlier, and I just want to say to my listeners, uh, we were uh, going to have Satan on the show in the next couple of weeks, but apparently the conservatives are on summer holiday and they're very hard, <laughs> very hard to get a hold of. Uh, we'll have to schedule that later on. Tell me about your physical state before and after learning Let's just focus on the physical state. I mean, because I, I, I want to compare it to uh, yoga or some other regular physical discipline. There, are, there is physicality <laughs> involved. There, there are two different things. I mean, yoga, you can... Uh, let me put it to you this way. When I, before I learned Falun Gong, I was, a, I was a stress bucket, right? I was always stressed out, and, you know, every, anybody could push my buttons quite easily, right? Um, the first time I went to a Falun Gong exercise site and I learned the exercises... I felt fantastic. It was almost like the energy stayed with me for a prolonged period of time. Um, that night after I left the exercise, I was driving home on the highway, and like, you know, true to form, some, someone cut me off. And instead of losing my mind, instead of losing, you know, and started swearing, for, for just kind of automatically, I stopped and I thought, oh, hold on a second, truth, compassion, tolerance. Right, and I stopped. I didn't react to that situation, whereas before I would have reacted for sure. Mm-hmm. And that was really interesting to me because I just was doing the exercises, but the the level of energy is called a gong energy as opposed to a chi energy. And the gong energy is is a lot more powerful and it's more sustained. It stays with you because you work for it. It's not like a chi energy where if you go for a massage, you feel fantastic, but you get home and your wife or your husband says something to you that drives you over the edge and you lose your mind, right? The gong energy stays with you, so it's able to help you uh, uh, remain more calm during our inevitable tribulations in life. Well, isn't there such a practice as qi gong? Yeah, that's so basically the, the uh, qigong, the, the ancient form of qigong was more pure, but qigong nowadays has become more of a healing and fitness, and, and again, it's a, a money-making system as well, right? So it's kind of lost its essence. Uh, it's lost its way. Yeah. Um, I'm fascinated by your emblem, which uh, would alarm some people who uh, don't uh, look too much into this. It is what appears to be the reverse of the swastika made, right. made famous in Germany back yep. in the their uh, war days and uh, persecution of Jews. Can you tell us about that, and do you ever have any kind of um, resistance? We used to in the beginning. Um, I mean, Falun Gong now has been practiced since 1994 in, in I think, 114 countries around the world. Uh, it's translated into, I think, 30 different languages at this point. Uh, practiced by millions of people, right? So it's become more known, um, more accepted. Uh, the Fallon, it's called a Fallon uh, uh, or swastika. You know, Hitler was very esoteric. He believed in the black magic, right? So um, this, for better, for lack of a better word, swastika has been seen in ancient Buddhism uh, for five thousand years. You can see it if you go to the ancient shrines and ancient caves where they would have these uh, swastikas on the foreheads of the Buddha on the on the cave walls uh, it, it was a it was a symbol of prosperity but also a symbol of purity um, uh, Hitler of course took this powerful symbol he turned it around and painted it black right, right? that's all so, it is it's just an inverse an inverse of the uh, of the of the pure symbol and and painted black so he used it for for evil means okay um, well we're speaking with Joel Chipcar who is a, I'm going to say an expert he, he knows more than I know about uh, Falun Dafa Falun Gong meditation and we will be right back my interview with Joel Chipcar uh, is about China so it's kind of part of meet the new owners So let's get the theme music up. Oh, it's already up? All right. I don't know. And uh, the Canadian anthem is what it is, as thematically reinterpreted by Canadian musician Bob Wiseman. Yes, China does have control over Canada's oil production industry, and because that's the case, our government would prefer that we keep any negative news about China, of which there is plenty, as quiet as possible. But that's not what this show is about. I think it's important that we not pretend China is the wonderful place that you might see pictures of in a travel agency. While it does uh, reflect those values, it is also the home of many strange 
things, other things, such as cancer villages. What is that you say? A cancer village? No, I didn't say a cancer village. I would never say a cancer village when it's true that what I did say was cancer villages plural, as in at least 400 cancer villages and climbing. Well, if there are that many of them, I guess we had better find out what they are. Unable to learn much in the Canadian press on the topic of cancer villages, yet again I have to turn to the foreign press. Surprise, surprise. So here we go to Quartz.com for this story. China's growth at all costs, quote-unquote, approach to development has meant industries can spew waste pretty much wherever they want. Drinking water sources? Sure. Farmland? Fine. That approach has poisoned entire towns, sending cancer rates soaring. There are now so many that they've earned their own moniker of cancer villages. Conservative estimates have found more than 100 of them in China, but the number of cancer villages could be as high as 400, though, say recent reports. At least the government is now acknowledging their existence. This admission came in its newly unveiled plan to curb the release of toxic chemicals, a major move considering these matters pose potential threats to its stability. China's water pollution is visibly rampant. Investigative journalist Deng Fei recently launched a top-trending campaign on Sina Weibo, inviting users to upload photos of their hometown rivers. And you can't believe the horrendous photographs that are uploaded here. Of course, trash is the least worrisome problem. In a survey of 40,000 chemical and petrochemical plants, 23% of hazardous plants were within 5 kilometers or 3 miles, for the international listener, upstream of drinking water sources. Upstream of drinking water sources, reports the South China Morning Post. It's already costing China a lot. Speaking with Britain's The Telegraph, Deng said, if the issue of groundwater pollution is not properly solved, not only will it kill people, but it will also drag down the entire health care system because of the number of cancer patients it causes. And now this from Marketplace.org. Uh, it says China's Toxic harvest growing tainted food in the cancer villages. So it's not bad enough that stuff is flowing by. They're actually planting stuff. The hill of chemical waste beside farmer Wu Shulang's rice paddy began to take shape in the 90s. It was yellow and green and it smelled terrible, says Wu, standing on the edge of his rice paddy in rural Yunnan in the southwest of China. The waste was from a factory next door, but he was growing stuff in it anyway. It's a byproduct from making chemicals used for tanning leather. Each day for 20 years, workers dumped more of it, making the hill bigger and bigger. Last year, an estimated 300 million pounds of chemical sludge towered over his land in the river below. Whenever it rained, our rice paddy in the river would suddenly turn bright yellow. Much of my rice died. It killed everything in its path. But not all the rice, because then they would still market whatever was left there, and people eat that. This is What's Going On in China. So let's go back to our interview with Joel. Okay, Joel, we can uh, keep talking. So that's that's what Hitler did uh, with the symbol. So you're trying to claim it back. But do you ever do you ever come up in a conversation and people say, "Hey, you guys have a, a swastika there. What, what's that all about?" No, not really. Not no. anymore. In in the beginning, we did, but um, again, it's it's many many people know that it's a symbol that has its place in history for five thousand years, right? Right. Okay, so you you were able to um, to have uh, compassion and understanding. So this is we could say Fallen Gong is great for uh, reversing the phenomenon known as road rage. Well, you know, it's uh, again Falun Gong is a is a profound discipline, right? And like any kind of discipline or religion, it's a path, right? So people are on this path. And it takes time to learn the path. Just because I've been doing it for 14 years doesn't mean I'm Buddha. It doesn't mean, you know, I've, I've enlightened or I've transcended. Every day we go through tribulations that press our buttons, and we have a choice of, of how we want to uh, react or act to those. And Falun Gong just gives you some tools to make, you know, different choices. Okay. Um, this uh, road to enlightenment, are you... Um you're, you say you're not there yet, and it's a journey. Are you uh, intellectually aware, uh, at least, of what enlightenment is from the perspective of a Falun Gong practitioner? Well, from the perspective of Falun Gong, and from the perspective of, of other of other teachings as well, the 
you know, the end result, the goal of every human being is to ascend back to where we come from. Like Falun Gong believes that every human is actually a god that has fallen here, and our our goal is to get back to where we come from. So you have Jesus who came down to teach the way so people can get back to heaven. You have the Buddha who came to teach people how to reach enlightenment and, and gain consummation, right? Falun Gong helps people to uh, enlighten to their path so they as well can get back to their to where they come from. So, you know, um, this is the premise of all of the Orthodox religions, and um, uh, that in a nutshell, is what true enlightenment it means. is about. And have you met someone uh, well developed in the practice who who you would consider to be, uh, for lack of a better term, more enlightened than you uh, as a result of practicing? You know what? At times, I mean, at, at times I'm I'm enlightened, and then and then the next day I'm not. I mean, it's not like uh, you know, it's not like you can. You know, you paint yourself golden and walk down the street, right? Like, yeah, it's not a vacation destination. That's right. It's it's the journey, right? So, of course, on the journey, we're like we all face tribulations on a daily basis, and these are tests, right? And they help us to choose the right path. All right. Where where do you find yourself uh, uh, with this uh, practice and journey? Where do you position yourself, or how do you take in? Uh, I'll just call it loosely the nonsense of the world, politics, things that you don't agree with, things that go on and, and could or may affect your life in other ways that maybe, I mean, you're, I know you're going to tell me that this uh, practice helps you uh, better react or not react to those uh, uh, provocations and injustices, but uh, how do you now look at things that used to bother you on a, on a not just in a traffic sense, but in a political sense? Well, one of the main main uh, teachings of Falun Gong is not to get involved in politics, and this is one of the propaganda tools used by the Chinese government to kind of paint Falun Gong as being bad. Is for somehow they somehow they got political and started to challenge the Chinese government. Well, that, that's nothing more than a lie. It says right in the teachings that politics is a dirty business. It's 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 based mostly on selfishness and don't get involved. So, um, on a principle, that's what we follow. But like on a community sense, you know, if something's going on in my community, I can get involved. If I, I, I vote, you know, like there's certain there's certain uh, uh, you know things that, as as a human being, you you want to give to your, you give back to your community. You want to make sure things on 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 this level are are you know going fine. It's like you know Falun Gong also teaches you just don't go up to a mountain to cultivate until you reach consummation. You have to be responsible in society. You have to take care of your family. You have to work hard, and uh, and be a good be a good person. All right. Well, that's a good piece of advice. Everybody listening could stand to be a good person. Um, so this this practice started inside of China, that's right? Started inside China in 1992, and at that time, uh, it was actually supported, awarded, and endorsed by the Chinese Communist Party. They uh, they they uh, supported the founder uh, to give his teachings all over China. Uh, the Public Security Bureau, which is like the CIA or the FBI, uh, awarded Falun Gong for bringing back the crime-fighting virtues into society. There were news reports about how Falun Gong had saved the country millions of dollars in health care costs because the people who were practicing it, mostly elderly people, were becoming more healthy, right? Hmm. So it And that's documented. It was, oh, it's documented. Uh, uh, New York Times and uh, U.S. World News uh, had documented that coming from uh, uh, Premier Zhu Rongji at the time. He was uh, he was the premier at the time. So, and this is back in uh, uh, in in uh, 1995, uh, 1998, 1997, 1998. So, so those were the good days. It was highly supported, awarded. You had high rank members of the Communist Party practicing it. The, 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 their their family members practicing it. Um, it spread faster than any spiritual discipline in in, in China's history. And, and there are other. Uh, speaking to someone who's uh, a bit ignorant on a lot of these levels uh, right now, Joel, but there are a lot of other uh, religious and spiritual practices that do go on there. Well, this this is the issue, Alan. This is what happened. Is like, yes, you, you do have, uh, you know, Buddhism there, you have Christianity there, you have the Catholics there, you have Judaism there, you have Hinduism. 
All kinds of things uh, happen in Qigong. Everything is in China. But in order to have your spiritual faith, you must swear allegiance to the Communist Party over your belief in your chosen God. Mm. You have to put the Communist Party first. You have to be controlled by the Communist Party. And this was the problem the when clash, uh, the clash inside with, China. With this, Falun is, Gong's uh, directives is specifically say no to that. Well, no, not, not at all. What, what, what happened was the Communist Party approached the founder, and they said at the time, listen, this is really, you know, taken off. We want to control it, and we want to start charging money for it. And mm. the founder said no. And he ended up pulling away from the China Qigong Research Society. That was the arm of the Communist Party that was, you know, controlling all of the Qigong and Tai Chi and the, and the spiritual disciplines in China. He pulled away from that. And at that point, that was in 1994, at that point, the Communist Party started to attack Falun Gong. And, and even while some of the practitioners were Communist Party members. Oh, yeah. The police, Communist Party members, um, like high-ranked people. Right. So what happened was the the abuse and the, you know, the attacks continued to escalate uh, and escalate until 1999, when uh, when practitioners were arrested in a nearby town. Um, They were put into jails because they went to uh, appeal to a local newspaper who wrote a really bad article uh, about Falun Gong in the newspaper, um, edged on by Communist Party members, right? So uh, they went to appeal. They got thrown in jail. Practitioners came to help clarify the truth to get them out of jail, um, but the, the, the jail wouldn't let them out. So word got out, and then people went to Jonan Hai, which was the government compound in Beijing, to finally appeal for Falun Gong's constitutional rights to practice their faith without being harassed, right? and and but they are uh, so that that begins the the chapter uh, in Falun Gong history of imprisoning the practitioners. That's it's close. It's, it's we're getting there. <laughs> okay, uh, so, so basically, people uh, that did not want to uh, submit first to the Communist Party. And that's where that's where uh, the the tea card got upset. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah, that's where it got upset. And then, of course, the abuse and the like. Practitioners would be in the parks doing uh, doing their exercises, maybe 100, 200 strong. And then a communist party vehicle would come by with a water cannon and just blast them all. Wow. Or they'd come by with a truck that would be blaring loud music and just disrupt everybody. Right. And this was happening for years. So practitioners basically decided, listen, you know what, let's appeal for our rights to practice our faith in peace, which is in the Chinese constitution, right? Wow. But, so they went, they, they went to appeal for their, for their, uh, their beliefs. Uh, 10,000 practitioners uh, gathered outside of uh, the Beijing compound where they were met by the premier at the time, Zhu Rongji, who I discussed earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, a few uh, of the spokespeople were, were led into the government compound. They had a meeting for about two hours, and Zhu Rongji uh, agreed that, hey, you know what? Don't worry about it. We'll give you, you guys your, your freedom to believe. Uh, sorry for whatever happened. I'll get to the bottom of it, and rest assured, we'll take care of it. <laughs> so all 10,000 people went home. And that was it. Do you feel that he was sincere when he said these things? He was very sincere. The issue was that the very next day, the president of China, the, 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 his name was Jiang Zemin, he ordered an, immediate, uh, uh, an urgent meeting where he lambasted Zhu Rongji for taking sides with Falun Gong. And at that point in time, he had made the decision to use Falun Gong as a political uh, target to basically uh, get other Communist Party members to see that he was a strong leader and that, uh, you know, if you crossed him, this is what could happen to you. So he basically used Falun Gong as a tool, and on uh, July 20th, 1999, he ordered the uh, elimination of Falun Gong inside China. And at that time, uh, and this is like 10 years after the uh, the famous tank protests in Tiananmen Square, yeah. so, so we know they can play hardball. Yeah. Uh, so ten years later, this happens. At that point, how many people would would you estimate or guesstimate, if necessary, were practitioners of of uh, Falun Gong in China? Okay, based on Chinese government surveys, and based on uh, uh, them being um, uh, reported in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. 70 to 100 million practitioners. 70 to 100 million practitioners is the number I'm getting now from Joel. Uh, 
That's incredible. Just think about how large. That's like two Canadas or more. Three times the population of Canada. Three, yeah. Well, if you go with 100, yeah it's, yeah, it's about three times the population. Okay, so just think on that for a second, and we'll be right back. Just a quick reminder here that you can offer feedback by going to the website conspiracyqueries.com or reaching us on Twitter at con underscore queries at Twitter. All right, given the conditions we're hearing about, it should come as no surprise that over 600 people, I would think it would be more, have offered their services to get the hell out of China, probably forever. Yeah, I just don't understand why that number is so low. But uh, according to NTD.TV, a Chinese website, Dutch entrepreneur Baz Landorp has a long-cherished hope to send people to Mars. His Mars One project plans to establish a permanent human colony on Mars. The project was launched in Shanghai, and there are already more than 600 people lining up to go. It's really my dream, my ambition, to take humans to Mars, and this is just the only way. Two men and women will be chosen for the colony, but today's technology can't guarantee a return trip. (laughs) But that doesn't stop Chinese people from wanting to get on that flight as soon as possible. Because as we're about to find out, uh, much denial of the organ harvesting that goes on in China and much of that to do with Falun Dafa and its family and friends. Uh, A reporter has won an award for exposing the forced organ harvesting in China. This is also on NTD.TV. And uh, he has won an award from the Society of Professional Journalists, which reading the newspapers these days can only number in, in the tens. For a series of articles he wrote on China's murky transplant system. His name is Matthew Robertson. He's a China specialist for the English edition of the Epoch Times newspaper. He's fluent in Mandarin and was able to do more investigative research from Chinese websites than most English reporters. But even without a language barrier, the lack of reliable information made it difficult. But he triumphed and stuck with it and has, in fact, won a journalism award. So that's what's happening in China. All right, let's bring Joel back on. Let's say 100 million people are practitioners of Falun Dafa. This is in 1999 when the hammer came down. Uh, How were people rounded up and arrested? Well, let me me kind of give you the scope of the persecution first so you can kind of get an idea of that. The government mobilized basically all of Chinese society, from media to the police, from education to to the judiciary, um, they used relentless propaganda campaigns, labeling practitioners as obsessed, evil, unbalanced, cult-like members, um, threats to the nation, quote-unquote political. Uh, they also created an extra legal uh, police force called the 610 Office, which hunted, arrests, and detains Falun Gong practitioners without trial in re-education camps throughout, uh, throughout China. Without trial. Without trial. Whereas uh, United Nations estimates that... Uh, um, uh, Two thirds of the of the inmates now in Chinese labor camps are Falun Gong practitioners. Right, those who are brought to trial have have seen their lawyers stripped of their legal license or, or imprisoned. Um, over a hundred million people now in China are in exile today. Right, hundreds of thousands are in labor camps, and thousands have been killed in police custody. To the point where in 2008, the United Nations stated that we are concerned that the reports of arrest, torture, sexual violence, deaths, and unfair trials of Falun Gong practitioners may reflect a deliberate policy to target Falun Gong. The cruelty and brutality of these alleged acts of torture defy description. You know, I have to jump in here and say that uh, if this is what is the result of practicing uh, Falun Gong, that uh, I have so much awe... I won't quite say respect because I don't know enough about it yet, but I have a, a certain uh, high measure of awe uh, towards the practitioners because, you know, earlier you stated that you don't get involved in politics and it's, you know, dirty work and et cetera. But for someone to stick with the choice between, um, you know, dropping out, can we say, of the practice – or staying true to yourself and your path and experience this kind of uh, persecution is incredible to me. And that just astounds me because, you know, why 
why choose to stay in there? I mean, obviously, there's something uh, about it where and, and and we were talking earlier about road rage and, you know, getting over uh, your reactions to things. Man, you have got to have some kind of um, awarenesses and, and enlightenment uh, to some level put together where I'm sure these people are still practicing. Uh, some measure of Falun Gong as much as they can while being in prison, while being persecuted, and they 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 stay on that side of the fence. They do, and uh, it, it's it, basically you know I've I've thought the same thing myself, and you know being in Canada and uh, you know being able to practice freely, even though I see the reports, the death sent, the death reports, and the torture reports come through my desk every day. Um, I can't imagine what it's like to live under that kind of pressure inside China. And, you know, from my point of view, when someone asks me that, I basically say, what are you supposed to do, right, when those with all the power are attacking those with none? Right. Right. You stand up. You stand up and tell the truth, right? And this is what Falun Gong practitioners are doing. Like, today the Communist Party is responsible for terrible crimes against humanity, and these practitioners are selfless, selflessly trying just to awaken people to support the cause, not for themselves or to get you to join the practice, but to help save others. Well, that doesn't stop Canada from being able to broker all kinds of uh, huge number of business deals with them. Yes, and well, you know what? I have to hand it to the government, though. Like we've had, um, uh, we've had a couple of resolutions passed unanimously to call on China to stop the persecution of Falun Gong. Um, we've had, uh, uh, I mean, you know, a lot. We have a Friends of Falun Gong uh, organization inside the the, the uh, Parliament Hill there, where you know members of the Parliament uh, have joined to help support Falun Gong. I mean, the the Prime Minister gives us greetings for Falun Dafa Day. I know that they've brought up behind closed doors um, the persecution of Falun Gong, but of course, much much more. Uh, must be done to uh, to stop this from happening. And when you say to stop this from happening, let's let's cut to the chase here. What kind of things are happening uh, to these practitioners? While uh, and remember, everyone, we're talking about you know a hundred million practitioners, many of which are uh, imprisoned and without trial, without representation, etc. What's going on there? Let me let me just get right down to the to to the to the most the most horrific atrocity that uh, that we found. In 2006, an investigation led by award-winning human rights lawyer and Nobel Peace Prize nominee Mr. David Maidis, uh, along with former Canadian Secretary of State uh, for Asia-Pacific David Kilgore, brought forth chilling evidence that over 41,500 Falun Gong practitioners were killed so their organs could be sold to transplant patients for up to $160,000 U.S., so you're talking about, from what we know, over 41,000 practitioners who were killed, and while they're still alive, their organs are, are ripped out of their bodies to be sold by state-run hospitals on state-run websites to, uh, to transplant tourists. And how, to tourists? Transplant tourists, people coming from other countries looking for organs. They had, uh, I saw these websites as well, state-run hospitals had websites that stated right on the website, I couldn't believe it, that we can guarantee that we will have an organ for you uh, when you come to China. If that organ does not take, we guarantee to have another one for you within two weeks. Where can I find that website? Oh, they've taken that down uh, uh, probably two years ago now. Incredible. So we have, I'm, I'm we, a... have ca- we have uh, captions of it, um, frame you know freeze frame captions of it. Uh, this is Chinese and English because they're they're you know, advertising to uh, uh, Western Western people as well. But how long do you have to wait? How long do people have to wait in Canada or the U.S. for a liver or a heart? You're talking years. So I'm a rich guy. I'm a I'm a fairly successful, uh, you know, businessman. And I've decided, or my doctors decided that uh, the old uh, the old liver, the kidneys aren't doing so well, and I can get myself on a waiting list, or I can just uh, pick up a fresh transplant by flying to China and having the procedure done there if I'm paying top dollar. That's right. It's basically a farm. Based on Chinese government-owned statistics, um, because we know they they have the death penalty over there, but based on their statistics, um, there's a discrepancy in their own records of over 41,000 organ plant transplant donors. 
And the evidence that uh, this David Kilgore and Davis, David Maidis gave uh, to the international public uh, was so compelling that in 2008, the United Nations asked the Chinese regime twice to explain the discrepancy in the Communist Party's own records of a missing 41,500 organ transplant donors and to tell the UN where they got the, the organs from. Both times, the Communist Party refused to answer. But isn't it true, on that same note, that this kind of uh, activity was already, uh, when I'm talking about this kind of, I'm talking about organ harvesting and yeah. selling it to the a high bidder. That was already going on in China prior to the clampdown on Falun Gong. And then once, once the clampdown took place, that number skyrocketed. It skyrocketed. We have statistics here where, where it completely skyrocketed uh, after 2003. And see, the issue uh, with Falun Gong practitioners is when they're arrested, if they're, out, uh, if they're doing the exercises or they're out you know, trying to appeal for, for their rights, if they're arrested and they're thrown in jail, they are reluctant to give their names because they don't want their family members to be incarcerated or attacked. So, you know, you have, a, you, you have hundreds of thousands of John and Jane Doe's inside these jails and labor camps, and the evidence suggests that, uh, we, you know, they, they are systematically blood tested and uh, uh, to see if they, could, they, get, they can get their, their, uh, um, become a match for a certain organ transplant uh, uh, patient. If I'm hearing you right, you're telling me that a practitioner's family can also be sought out, and they don't necessarily need to be practicing Falun Gong. No. No, they can get sought out. They, they would lose their jobs. They lose their pensions. They, get, they lose their housing. Um, they're also thrown in jail. They're abused physically. Uh, all in, a, in an effort to, uh, you know, to rid, uh, to rid society, the, the, the practitioner from, uh, you know, from practicing Falun Gong. At this point, and this might be a bit morbid, but we've already been discussing organ harvesting. I don't know how much more morbid we can get, but uh, I have a bit of a theory that a lot of the problems of society, whether it's China or Canada or anywhere, um, are are designed to be there, and that the actual uh, resolution is either ignored or outlawed because there is a physical financial benefit to allowing things to continue. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to ask you, do you, do you think that uh, they're really trying to eliminate Falun Gong anymore, whereas once they might have been doing so, but by actually eliminating it, they're going to eliminate the ability to harvest those organs and to sell those uh, those parts to uh, the rich uh, from around the world is this? Would you would you would stop the business of organ profiteering uh, by eliminating Falun Gong? Well, I, I'd say yes, but I but in this situation, I would say no because number one, the cat's now out of the bag. So that's Pardon a good question because and I and, and the, the 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 answer I want to give you came from a Chinese government official himself who actually defected to the West in two thousand and six. And he said that the Chinese Communist Party has always relied on violence, lies, and advocating atheism to maintain its power. They could not understand Falun Gong practitioners' peaceful efforts to protect their freedom of belief. Now they cannot let the international community know what has been done to Falun Gong in China. So it's in the Chinese government's best interest to eliminate the proof eliminate Falun Gong practitioners, stop them from, from discussing this, you know, pressure Western governments to, to remain silent uh, through, through trade, right? Pressure Western media to shut up or else lose their contracts in China. Hide the situation because the Communist Party members are responsible for heinous crimes against humanity. And in the future, they will be judged for these crimes. So well, it's that's why I wanted you to, to 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 eliminate to cover up this persecution as much as possible. Now. That's that's why I wanted you on the show because I think uh, the show is about you know not enough exposure on certain topics as far yeah. as far as I see it, and uh, I want I want this out there. It's kind of why I was asking you earlier about um, you know Canada does business with them and and they don't really like having these types of things discussed. Certainly not on a major media outlet. Uh, such as uh, Sirius XM Radio or anywhere else. Um, we think, uh, Alan, that, uh, you know, the key to ending this is awareness, right? So every media report is important. Um, we caution, 
you know, other organizations to be very careful of where they get their information from because some of these reporters today are basically just parachute reporters and they just take information from the Chinese government and they post it as fact because they haven't done their investigation. So they start to spread the propaganda and the lies uh, against Falun Gong, which basically aids in the elimination of these people inside China. So, you know, propaganda has been the number one weapon in every genocide campaign in, in our history. Right, yeah. from Hitler's elimination of the Jews to the Rwandan massacre to the Bosnian massacre. Propaganda is used to, uh, you know, hide the perpetrator's crimes and brainwash the public to think that these Falun Gong people, these Jewish people, these, you know, Tutsis in Rwanda somehow deserve what is happening to them. So that international community will turn their back on the persecution. This is what we've also seen happening uh, towards uh, Falun Gong, yeah. to Falun Gong based on the Chinese government's uh, incessant billion-dollar propaganda machine. Wow. They do spend a lot of money uh, trying to make this uh, an evil thing. Well, you know what? But, I mean, look at the facts. Falun Gong has been practiced all over the world since 1994, not by millions of people. Not one Falun Gong practitioner has ever been arrested. Outside <laughs> of China, yeah. Anywhere else in the world, right? Right. Only in China, where media is blocked, international bodies are, are forbidden to enter. Um, you, you uh, Are these, you know, so-called crimes that Falun Gong practitioners are, are committing uh, are happening? But they're not happening anywhere else in the world, you know, for the past, what, 14, 15 years strong. If I'm looking for uh, an organ myself and going back to the morbid uh, awareness here, mm. I- I'm going to I'm going to do myself pretty well to get one from a, to get a liver or a kidney from a Falun Gong practitioner who is is clean and, and doesn't drink and doesn't smoke. Doesn't drink, doesn't smoke. And you know what? We don't know who they are because they haven't given you the name. So they basically just disappear. Their families don't know where they went. The guards don't know who they were. They're hated in China by the public because of this incessant propaganda that, have, that has dehumanized them. So they're not looked at as human beings anymore. So, hey, why don't we kill? Listen to this. This guy's name is Enver Tati. He's a, a, a Muslim. Uh, he's an Uyghur. Uh, he's a surgeon that, uh, that lived in China. And the Uyghurs are in an autonomous region, more in the north. In June 1995, he was working in northwest China, and he was told that he would be performing his first operation outside. So, but when he arrived at the destination, he was shocked to find at least 10 prisoners has been, had been shot in the field by a firing squad. The armed police waved him over and his medical team and directed them uh, to a man lying unconscious on blood-soaked ground. He'd been shot in the right-hand side of the chest but was still alive. Tati told his chief surgeon that this person, he wasn't dead, but the chief surgeon ordered him to remove the man's liver and kidney there and then and to be quick about it. He was also ordered not to give the man any anesthetic. Wow. So this is what's been happening to tens of thousands of Falun Gong practitioners inside China today. Well, this obviously has to end. It's a horrendous practice that that still goes on incredibly. I can't get my head around the fact that we do any trade with them. You and I differ on that point, um, but that's okay. Oh, no, what? I don't differ on that point at all. I, I, I was, uh, you know, I, I agree with you 100%. I think uh, when trade uh, when trade's on the on the table, human rights go right out the window. Yeah. Well, what can we do, uh, Joel, when when someone says, and when I say someone, I mean that Chinese officials uh, repeatedly, as Wikipedia says, repeatedly and firmly deny the organ harvesting allegations, Mm. uh, where can you point us to show that that is, in fact, a reality? And in, in just a minute or two, what can we do to help bring this horrendous practice to an end? I think, like I said, the the awareness is the key. It's like it's like a light bulb turning on into a dark room. Once you turn on the light, the darkness disappears. The more awareness that comes out about this persecution, the faster it's going to end. And in every genocide in our history, it 
sooner or later comes to a close and those who are responsible will face justice, it's really important for those onlookers, those people who are watching, to choose the right side, right? Because once the test is over, once everybody knows that the persecution was wrong and the Chinese government was evil for doing this, it would be, it'll be too late to change sides, right? So I, I implore people just to get more information and to just remember, you know what, the Chinese government... Year after year, they're branded the number one human rights abuser in the world. They're responsible for the murder of 80 million of their own citizens in, in, in their 60-year reign. So, like, you Google China denies, and you get over 5 million hits. Wow. It doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out, you know, who's right and who's wrong. In my opinion, if China says black, you can bet your life and the life of your children that it's white. Wow. Joel Chipkar has been speaking with us, um, representing Falun Dafa, the meditative and spiritual practice. Joel, where can we find out more information about Falun Dafa? Faluninfo.net. F-A-L-U-N-I-N-F-O dot net. Faluninfo.net is our main uh, is our main website for more information. Okay, thank you very much for coming on Conspiracy Queries. I appreciate it. Alan, my pleasure. Thanks for listening to Conspiracy Queries with Alan Park. Please offer comments or complaints by emailing conspiracyqueries at gmail.com or on Twitter at con underscore queries or at our website, conspiracyqueries.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>